Now, of course, I have to make an apology because many of the, many of the experts uh, in string theory are in the audience, so I have to first of all apologize to that group. So uh, it's going to be kind of uh, trying to go back and trying to understand what have we learned about string theory. So we know string theory, you know, we, we say it's the theory of everything and it's the, it's the most promising candidate for theory to, to try to describe Einstein's theory of gravity, combining it to, with quantum mechanics. And the usual picture we say, you know, the point particles are replaced by string-like objects. Everything is somehow a nice description geometrically. You replace points, quarks by strings, and you have interactions between strings, they join, and so on. So there's a nice story, nice, nice geometry associated with that. But, um, but unfortunately, after how many years now? Um, well, many, many years, we still view this work as much in progress. Mm -hmm. And it's a slightly, uh, well, it's a little bit embarrassing, after all, working on this subject for so many years. What do we have to show for it? So, um, so the, the, the main name of this talk is that actually to try to say what have we learned, really, in some ways that one would say in general terms, without getting too technical about it. So what are the general lessons we are learning from it? Now, the things that we have, of course, the, there's a good reason we haven't learned, we haven't been able to connect it to what we really want to do, because the experiments are not a good guide anymore, because they are too far from being realized in the region of interest for string theory. So there, we have too, 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 we need too high an energy, so we don't have it. But even incomplete knowledge, as we have it today, actually has, has been uh, instrumental in telling us certain facts about string theory and about physics that is, we are sure about. In other words, we don't have a final version of the theory, and perhaps we are very far from it. But we do know a few things completely surely about it, which we can't say. So that's the, the aspect that I want to share, the things that we are, we are certain about. Now, these are in some kind of form of some kind of new principles which should fit in this bigger picture whenever that emerges, but we already know these pieces of these new principles. Of course, uh, the principles are under this uh, lamppost, uh, so I'm only going to talk about the parts that we have learned. It could be that there are much more exciting stuff out there which we have yet to learn, and that might very well be the case. But even the areas under the lamppost that we have already explored and we have learned about are already striking for teaching us about new fundamental physics, that's <coughs> what I want to emphasize. So first I will start with uh, historical lessons, just to put it in perspective of where we are aiming for and how we think about it in historical terms. So let's go back. And uh, we will recall that many of the developments of physics was always uh, somehow related to, to giving up something we thought was really fundamental. And so, if you go far enough back, well, people actually, uh, the Greek, for example, already knew that the Earth was round and so on, and they thought that the Earth was the center of the universe. Uh, they believed it. Uh, they didn't have this picture, of course, but they still had this picture that for various reasons they had even measured the radius of the Earth. They were very smart. And, uh, and they, in fact, used to argue using symmetry principles. And this is quite amusing, that symmetry ideas is not new. And Greeks were very fond of it. And in fact, they used to argue based on symmetry that Earth does not move. And the argument was very simple. Earth is spherical, that's the rotational symmetry. If it moves, it breaks that symmetry. So it cannot move. That was an explanation that the Greek offered for the for stationary of, of the Earth. But that's not where it ended. Aristotle disagreed with this reason. He said that uh, this, this, this cannot be necessarily the reason because the symmetry can be spontaneously broken. <laughs> <laughs> no, you might be thinking I'm joking. No, no, no. <laughs> he did not use this terminology, but he did use this picture. Well, not exactly this picture. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, suppose you have somebody at the middle of a circle, and you put food around it, equal distance. This has a rotational symmetry. And let that person stand there. Do you think that person is going to stand there forever, or is going to move and grab a piece of food when he gets hungry? <laughs> this, was his, uh, this, was, this is a very close to the way we think about spontaneous symmetry breaking. If you think about where the food is as lower energy, 
And where do you stand with the food as being a measure of energy or inversely related to energy? Then that's related to this picture. So that was his reasoning that that's not a good enough reason to say Earth is stationary. Very smart reasoning. Of course, uh, deep applications of the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking had to work, had to wait till the work of Nambu and Goldson, as we have heard today. But anyhow, we learned from even early days that you have to be careful about ideas of symmetry and its application and what it really means. And then we have other notions of absoluteness, absolute notion of time. And of course, this fellow told us it's not a good idea to think about it as an absolute. So the notion, notion of time as being absolute is not a good idea either. Absolute notion of the state of the system, that what, where things are, and position and momentum, we know that's not true either. Quantum fuzziness tells us it's not true. So we are giving up principles that we kind of already knew were there. Are, 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 are we are giving them up one by one. So I want to basically give you examples of what we think we have to give up in the context of string theory, similar to these principles that we have already given up. Now, uh, again, uh, it is somewhat reminiscent of early days of quantum mechanics where we know there are few things have to go and some things have to stay. And for example, the wavy nature of the particles have to be a correct picture. The particles are not, are not have a definite position momentum at the same time. So these things were understood very early on. And then it led to this picture of quantum mechanics. We don't have that picture yet. But we do have the angle of the picture. Yes, particles are wavy. You cannot think about them as position and momentum separately. So, so that's the level we are at in string theory. So let's just set the stage for it. And setting the stage actually is another piece of remarkable contribution of Nambu, which is the, the importance of duality. And this is, I think, is, is, is a key to what happened in the early days of string theory as well as the later days. In the early days, we had these dual resonance models where you had the symmetry between the two channels and the channel of the particles interactions. And the picture that the string explains that, the picture of the string, string unifies that it gives the geometric explanation of this duality was one of the cornerstones which led to the development of the subject. So in a sense, the subject didn't start with calling string theory, but dual resonance models, which is kind of the underlying feature of many other dualities that we discovered later in string theory of various different forms. So this is the general principle of duality that seems to play a role again and again in different forms. So the idea is that, in a more general setup, is that you have a physical system which depends on various parameters. And the system can look very different depending on how you tune your parameters. So the choices of background solutions in string theory, their size and shapes correspond to various points on this parameter space. And if you have a particular point here, and if you change your parameters, you can go to different regions in your, in your parameter space. And then there are interesting corners where the physics simplifies. And so there are some particular easy corners. And the middle is not necessarily easy, but the corners turn out to be typically be easy to understand in some way or another. And so let me just give them numbers, some names, one to six here. So in a sense, we can view these corner theories in some sense analogous to what Einstein's description of in the relativity frame as a reference frame. So and these simple theories, uh, we could call the duality frames because there's, they look very different. If you lived in any of these frames, you would experience physics very differently. And you would think that they, they have nothing to do with each other, just like you know, if you have in the context of uh, special relativity, you have E field and a B field, they look very different. But that just might be just a choice of which frame you're in. Same thing is happening with these frames. So that the physics looks very different. So then, just as in relativity, we ask, OK, we don't care about things which depend on the frame. We want duality invariant frames, or uh, the things that are Lorentz invariant. That's the, uh, what are the invariant objects. So we ask the same question. What are duality invariant objects? What can we say does not depend on where you are at? Can we summarize that? Because that would be what's fundamental. OK, so that's a natural question. Of course, we have a nice analogy with this with phase diagrams that you can uh, consider going from, a, let's say, a liquid phase to a gas phase. And there would be no particular point where you can distinguish them. In some ways, you can continuously go from one to the other. So it's in that context, you cannot really say, even though they look very different uh, at the end, but there's no particular point where you say something has happened. 
and uh, there's no particular order parameter in this sense that distinguishes them, but in a sense, the fundamental invariant problem in this case is that they are made of hydrogen and oxygen, H2O. So there's, there's in that, if you're talking about water, let's say, you're talking about that object, so that's an invariant notion. Of course, you can change the temperature and pressure and all that. That does not affect the existence of these objects in that form. So I like this picture because it reminds me of all these aspects of dualities that we see again and again in these contexts of string theory, where we have different corners of this diagram look like completely different stories going on. And uh, these, these are analogy to the corner theories I was telling you about. Uh, you know, you have the day here, night here, and also, and different things going on in the, the land here and so forth, different kinds of things. And this uh, drawing of Escher actually is very much captures the essence of duality in, in some ways. That if we lived over, if we just were in one part of this uh, frame, we would not anticipate the existence of these other ones being connected so smoothly. But this is how it happens, that there's only one frame, the whole thing is actually connected as to one whole, but different pieces might mislead us as to what's actually going on. The middle part is typically very complicated and doesn't look very interesting, or maybe it looks too interesting to understand in some simple form, but the corner ones certainly are easy to formulate as to what, what's going on in each corner. Okay, so now I begin to ask, what are the invariant concepts? What can we say is invariant in physics? Are particles the basic building blocks of matter? When, when we usually think about basic building blocks of matter, typically we think about them as particles as being basic building blocks, and that's when I first started graduate school, that's what we were told. Uh, now, in the context of string theory, we know that's not true. We know particles can be string-like if you go to shorter distances, or even membrane-like if you go even to other distance scales, or maybe even different dimensional objects. In fact, more generally, you can have different dimensions, and these are the brains of string theory. You can have stacks of them or higher dimensional versions of them. So there's a whole zoo of these guys. So fundamental par particles are not the basic building blocks of matter necessarily. And more than that, there will be relations between new objects ending on objects. These are brains ending on each other and so forth, which are very, very uh, different from a simple picture of just point particles being the basic building blocks. We can have strings ending on brains. And for example, if you have a, a bunch of these brains, n of them, and you have strings going from one to the other, they kind of fill out a matrix. And that matrix, n by n matrix, turns out to be related to a UN gauge groups. That's how the gauge symmetry gets realized in some examples in string theory. So particles can organize into matrices which come from strings and so on. So there's a whole zoo of these things. So already we learned that the basic building block of matter being point particle is not going to hold in the context of string theory. Okay, so that's the basics of particle. How about the basics of space? Is the diameter, length, lengths that we measure, are the diameter of a space, is that an invariant concept? Well, that's the first thing we learn in the context of uh, when we talk about Riemannian geometry or in the context of Einstein's theory of relativity, that invariant distance is an invariant distance. It's something everybody agrees on. If you take two points, space time, you can measure this, their distance if you go along a particular path. Now, uh, so that's what one might think. So for example, if you have a, if you have a circle of circumference R, then the time it takes for a, uh, a light to go around it, T, will be related to that R in this way. So you say, okay, easy enough. I'll just send a light ray around and say, see how much it takes, how long it takes to come back. From that, I will measure the radius or the circumference of the circle. And it turns out that this concept is not duality frame invariant. That is, there's a symmetry that exchanges R to the inverse of R in the string units. And the way that happens, this is what's called t-duality, one of the old dualities discovered in string theory, is a statement that if you have a, a light wave in one context, it corresponds to a wound string on the other side. So there's, a, there's an exchange between a, 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 what we call the momentum of a photon going around and a dual object, which in this case is a winding mode, so they have the same structures. The energy of a photon is n over r, the usual momentum modes, and here a winding string will be, if you have n times winding, will be n over r, because now the radius here, the circumference is one over r, so we'll have the same properties. 
Similarly, if you have a winding mode on this one, it corresponds to a momentum mode of the other guy. So what this means is that if you want to measure, if you want to measure the, the circumference of the, radi of the circle using this kind of light, you measure the radius to be r. But if you use this kind, you measure it to be 1 over r. Or not, in other words, if you use the winding modes, you measure the other one. So the statement is that there's not an invariant notion of what is light. So therefore, that gives you different notions of what is length. For a given light, you get a different length. So the length is not an invariant concept. OK. So, so it's metric is not invariant. How about the topology of a space? So let's go be even more basic. Is, that, is how the shape of this, uh, the general aspects, how many holes and so on does it have? Is that an invariant concept? For mathematicians, for sure it's an invariant concept. And, but it turns out that in the context of string theory, even this is not an invariant concept. So we have to give up with the absolute notion of what is the topology of a space. The same physical system in different frames can correspond to strings propagating on spaces with different topologies. So you can have a phenomenon called mirror symmetry will tell you that's how that happens. You can have two different geometries, two different manifolds. One of them might have a different number of holes compared to the other one. And if you view string propagating in one, it could be equivalent to a different string propagating in a different one. So there's a notion of what is a topology depends on who is telling you how you're measuring the topology with. It's not an absolute notion. Is the dimension of space and time 3 plus 1? Well, uh, the answer turns out to be no in the context of string theory. In fact, that's one of the very first things that people learned in string theory, that dimension is definitely not, seem to be not 4, because string theory was not consistent in four dimensions. And one needed extra dimensions. And the way we reconcile that with three macroscopic directions is to view these other dimensions as tiny. So we have tiny d-dimensional spaces, so we have some kind of a fiber geometry where we have an extended space three-dimensional and internal space to be tiny, whatever the number of dimensions are. So the dimension of space-time is not four either. The next question is the dimension of space-time and frame-independent statement. Can we make, so you might ask, okay, if it's not four, what is the dimension? The answer is that also is not an invariant concept. So we can't even tell you what is the dimension of space-time. Well, one simple example would be you take 10-dimensional space, and actually, if you think it's 10-dimensional, maybe you're wrong because there might have been an extra circle you didn't see, and that's what happened when we, when we discovered that string theory actually comes from M theory in 11 dimension. There was an extra circle in this story. Okay, so that actually happened in real time, so to speak. We learned that the, the dimension, we were fooled by the dimension being 10, but actually it was one more. But you say, well, this is kind of cheating. Well, actually, there was always 11 here. We just didn't see carefully enough. But that's not so. There are, well, before I say that, there are some, so in this case of 10 goes to 11, the objects also change dimension. The string became membrane. As the dimension grew, the objects themselves, like a string, became, grew one more dimension, become membrane-like. So that's how the, the theory became consistently lifted up one higher dimension. But you might say this is kind of cheating because, after all, there was an extra direction of a circle that we weren't seeing. But that's not so. There's, there's another example which illustrates that really we don't have an absolute notion of dimension of a space. For example, you take the 11-dimensional formulation of M-theory, the usual formulation, you put it on a two-dimensional torus, two-dimensional periodic space, and take the size of the two-dimensional space to be zero, or shrink it as much as you can. Shrink it to tiny space. Now you ask, what is the dimension of space you're left with? You naturally would say it's nine-dimensional. But actually, it turns out to be neither 9 nor 11. It turns out to be 10-dimensional. OK, so this is really telling you that there is no absolute notion of what is the dimension of the space, that there's, it depends on how you're actually measuring it. So it turns out the M theory, if you compactify it on a two-dimensional torus, shrinks the sizes. The theory becomes to, equivalent to a 10-dimensional theory, type 2B string in, on 10-dimensional space-time. So this is already telling you that we don't have a, a handle on saying, OK, what is it that if you ask us what it is, we could say, OK, each corner seems to have its own description in a nice way. But we cannot say what aspect of that corner is agreed in everybody's frame. 
So what is the duality frame invariant concept seems to be not trivial to come by. Certainly dimension, space, topology, those, don't, those do depend on the frames you're in. How about the notion of quantum geometry? Is there an absolute notion of composite versus elementary or fundamental constituents? Again, this is something that when, like 20, 30 years ago, when, you, when people encountered this, there was always the notion of, you know, we have elementary particles, quarks are elementary. The debate was whether things are elementary or not, but not that there's a notion of elementariness. We always view that perhaps electrons are elementary, but, you know, mesons aren't, and the quarks are, and so forth. We had very specific things of what, what are the basic ingredients, what are the fundamental objects, and what are composites. We just had to figure out which ones were, not whether or not the idea makes sense. So, so the question is, is there an absolute notion of composite versus elementariness? Or, so in particle physics, we have this idea that you can view things as composite versus elementary, as I just, uh, composite versus elementary was well-defined. But it turns out that this notion is duality frame dependent. We cannot have such an invariant notion. And already examples of it exist in the context of quantum field theories where uh, monopoles and electrically charged objects kind of reverse their roles depending on which limits of the quantum field theory we're describing. So which one is fundamental, which one isn't, depends on values of parameters. So monopoles can be viewed as configurations of gluons and electrically charged fields, which therefore are composite in one picture. But if you change parameters, they look like elementary, and in which case, the electrical objects could look more composite. So the notion of composite and elementaryness is not fundamentally definable. It just depends on which region we are at. Examples in string theory are a huge number of examples. The simplest one is in type 2B strings. There are two types of strings. One of them is a light string, and one is a very, very uh, uh, heavy strings. And as you change uh, the parameters of the theory, the coupling constant, the light string becomes heavy, and the, the heavy one becomes light. And so originally, the fundamental string was this light one, and the yellow one was what we call a D-brain. In the other side, the yellow one is what we call the fundamental string, and the red one is what we call the D-brain. So the notion of what is fundamental and what is not is not distinguishable. So if you're in the middle here, for example, and if I ask you which one of these two are fundamental, you wouldn't know what to say. Neither one is more fundamental than the other. So the notion of fundamentalness or compositeness is not definable either. Well, what does this imply about Feynman's path integral? Well, we are, we are used to telling our students, well, it's easy. You just define what are your fields, and you have some Lagrangian, and you take a, a, a point and another point, and it took all these paths that the fundamental objects can traverse. You sum over them, you get your amplitudes. That's the definition of quantum mechanics. Well, we now know that, in general, there's no fundamental notion of what is elementary. So what, what do I mean by doing this integral? Well, you might say, well, go to this corner and use this guy, for example, or go to this corner and use that guy. But there may be cases, and there are cases, where there are no corners, in some cases, and you're always in the middle. And we know that you cannot use both of them, because that would be inconsistent. We know on the, each corner, you couldn't have said, well, we use everybody. That would be overcounting the degrees of freedom. But we don't know what is replacing it. We don't know what replaces, the, even morally, what would be the Feynman's path integral mean in a situation where we don't know what is fundamental. So we don't even know how to go about replacing Feynman's, let alone the fact that we, always, we don't even know whether there's a Lagrangian. Another thing is, is a quantum effect, what is quantum and what is classical, is that an invariant concept? Well, in physics, we are used to a situation where we start with a classical description and quantize it. Basically, quantum mechanics makes it fuzzy. You have some classical path, and that becomes fuzzy as you turn on the h-bar. So that sounds what we, what we think it should be going on. But it turns out that the notion of quantum effects is also not frame, depend, frame independent. That what you call quantum versus classical depends on your frame. So you could start with the classical description, and you turn on h-bar, it becomes fuzzy, fuzzy. And if you turn on h-bar more and more, it becomes amazingly sometimes less fuzzy. And you end up with a, another picture, which is this other frame with classical description again. So whether you call going this way quantum or going the other way quantum is up to you. 
The notion of quantum is not an invariant concept. So quantum correction is you cannot say this is quantum versus this is quantum and this is less or more quantum than this. It depends on which direction you want to view it. So we don't even know what is quantum corrections mean. Of course, if you start with a given duality frame, it's a preferred description of what is classical, then there's a preferred description of what is quantum. But that's not an absolute concept. From this other frame viewpoint, going from here to here is making it even more quantum. So there is no absolute notion of what is quantum versus classical. So if you have these correlation functions, et cetera, where we expand it, somebody's h bar might look like one, somebody else's one over h bar. So there's no absolute notion for that. Now, so we go to the next case question. Does quantum matter exist in higher than 3 plus 1 dimension? Well, again, when I was starting graduate school, I remember people trying to argue why we live in 3 plus 1 dimension based on the statement that the only interesting interacting quantum field theories are in 3 plus 1 dimensions. And there will be various arguments for this. And the, the basic argument related to point particles having, uh, you know, if you have a random walk, it has the usual idea that you have a, a Hausdorff dimension two-dimensional, and so two plus two is four, and in four dimensions they interact, so you can have interesting interacting point particle theories in three plus one dimension, and that's kind of was agreeing with all these beautiful theories we were getting from quantum field theories, gauge theories, and so on. So people kind of were happy with this situation. We live in three plus one dimension because interesting quantum field theories are in that dimension, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, when string theory came along, it kind of shed, brought a little bit of doubt about that because string theory didn't like four dimensions, only had to go higher dimensions. But, but that still was if you were talking about gravity aspects. But particle aspects, like things that we are made of and so on, still sounded four-dimensional. Except that, uh, so, so this is what I need to clarify. So when we say higher dimensional, we mean, of course, uh, are there decoupled theories from gravity? Can we talk about matter systems which don't think, rely on gravity for their existence? like things like matter we were talking about, we can forget about gravity when we talk about interactions that, uh, about matter that we are talking about, that we are made of, for example. Are there similar systems? Can they exist in higher than four dimensions? And uh, I told you about this heuristics about three plus one and why it could be the highest dimension, but we have learned in the context of string theory that there are uh, higher dimensional consistent quantum systems all the way up to six, not higher. So if, at least we don't know if their higher ones can exist or not, but we have learned that up to six they do exist as matter systems which are decoupled from gravity. So we could have perfectly consistent matter systems in higher dimensions. Where in this case, the notion of what is elementary, what plays the role of particles, is replaced by the notion of tensionless strings. So they somehow string plays a role in these contexts, and interacting particles and strings uh, turn out to be what is the the, uh, uh, what, it takes the, what leads to an interesting quantum system in these cases. Now, these theories are very interesting, and they're very enigmatic, and we do not know how to do computations with these theories. So it's one of the amazing pa power of string theory to come up with existence of these theories, but even, even so, we don't know how to compute with them. In fact, these are among the theories which also violate the next condition. Does every theory have to have a Lagrangian? And it turns out that these theories, as far as we know, they don't have a Lagrangian. At least we, don't, we haven't found one. So it's conceivable that there is no Lagrangian description for these theories. So this notion that everything to have a Lagrangian, a basic ingredient and all that, seems to go against at least this example. But we know they exist. Now, do black holes have microstates? Well, this was a question that was posed by the work of Beckinsale and Hawking, where uh, we actually now know this sounds like an interesting picture given the gravity waves, but anyhow. So, so we know that, according to the picture of Beckinsale and Hawking, that there is indeed a huge amount of microstate expected, but this was one of the big puzzles about how to explain this. And uh, why is the number of states goes like exponential of the area of the horizon? And this is actually uh, the hint of a holography that already was, was there back then, where instead of the number of degrees of freedom going like volume, it goes like area. And the main questions were, what are these states? Where are they hidden? 
And uh, string theory comes and gives a good answer to this. So where are they hidden? Turns out to be related to an embarrassment of string theory. Embarrassment of string theory was that the dimension of string theory was more than 3 plus 1. So we had extra dimensions. And we usually try to compactify and get rid of them. So that was an embarrassing situation. We want to hide away the dimensions. And where, what these states are, again, turned out to be an objects that we were missing in string theory. These extended objects, these higher dimensional objects, turned out to be the relevant to resolving this problem. So it turns out both the extra dimensions and extra kinds of brains were necessary to resolve this question in the context of string theory. So in the context of string theory, we have a situation where if you think about our space as this extended uh, blue space here, and your internal space is like this donut, and if you wrap around some kind of a membrane around it, which is localized at a given point in space, it gives you a, a, a state. But if you wrap more and more around this, you can make more and more massive objects and what we could call black hole. If, if it wraps around sufficient number of times, so if I can manage to get this going. So it deforms the geometry of space if it wraps around it. Yeah. So, so we have a picture like this where we can wrap around brains around it and we deform the geometry of the space and we just say, oh, the number of degrees of freedom of here can be counted not by looking down here as Bickenstein and Hawking were doing in this case, but it's hidden up there in the extra dimensions of string theory by wrapping these objects around. So counting of how these are wrapped around gives an answer to what is the entropy of these black holes, at least in certain examples that have been studied in string theory, uh, especially the context of supersymmetric examples. So this, this gives you a model for how these kind of things can occur in string theory, but it also says that there's an interplay between what we think should be a decoupled question of gravity in lower dimension with something might be going on in the internal dimensions of the theory. Next question, are electromagnetic forces distinguishable from gravitational forces? Or can one arise from the other? It turns out that the answer to this question is surprisingly that gravity and other forces are not fundamentally distinguishable. And it depends on the frame that you're asking it from. So it's not a duality invariant concept. Now, this is surprising from both viewpoints, and actually both of them can occur. Namely, a gravitational context can fool us and lead to an electromagnetic type forces and vice versa in, 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 in interesting ways. For example, if you take a conical, if you, if you look at a cone, so you have a conical singularity, so this is a gravity kind of background. So if you consider this kind of a background, something singular is happening at one point. The curvature is singular there. What we have learned in the context of string theory is that you can have different kinds of conical singularity or more, more general singularities where at the singularity lives a gate system. So gravity mimics for you a gate system. So you cannot decouple questions about gravity from gate systems. So gate system is encoded in gravity in this way. So gravity can mimic electromagnetic type forces. That's what this shows. The reverse is also true. That is, electromagnetic type forces can also mimic gravity. And this is an amazing subject, as you well know, called holography. And the famous example is in the context of 4D systems. So you have 4D quantum system, where if you consider a gauge system in four-dimensional space, it mimics gravity in five-dimensional theory. So, so the extra dimension and the, the gauge theory description on the boundary is giving you all the information about the gravity part, at least in principle. So this is already showing you that there is no invariant notion of saying what is gauge theory now versus gravity. Of course, to get this picture working, you need a very bizarre type or strange type of electromagnetic kind of theory. You take an SUN gauge theory, so it's much more complicated than the U1 case, and you have to take N to be very large. So for very large N, this is true. But this also tells you, is for, for any N it's true actually, not just for large N. But for large N, this picture becomes easy to draw. That is, what does that mean? That means the internal part, the, the five-dimensional geometry, is not highly curved. But even for n equals to 2, like SU2 gauge theory, this same picture is still true. So SU2 gauge theory, n equals to 4, is a gravity theory. It's gravity theory on a very curved space, that's all. 
Okay, so if you wanted to think about SU2 gauge theory in four dimensions with n equals to four Young Mills, it's just a few bunch of fields, nothing too complicated. You can write down the Lagrangian on a line, not too complicated system. You are describing a gravity system in a highly curved space. Therefore, there is no invariant way of distinguishing that theory from gravity. Now, you can take that theory, put it on a lattice, quantize it, and so on, and you can say, well, it's made of just lattice points, and lattice points are made of some integrals, and so on. So ultimately, you reduce everything to some simple integrals of simple forms, and you're saying that's equivalent to quantum gravity in some form. It's remarkable. So there's no duality invariant way of saying where you started talking about gravity, where you start, stop talking about gauge theory. And so in this case, for example, the information is in terms of the graviton scatterings, which gives you equivalent data for what's going on in terms of the correlations of the gauge theory. So another very way to think about this is that you start with a geometry where you have brains, and brains deforms the geometry, and it in includes, includes the, gives rise to a new geometry. So it's what we call geometric transitions. So that's one way to understand uh, how you think about the holography where this so if you think about the original space the brains are wrapped, it shrinks, and you end up getting the new geometry where the brains are replaced by the foxes in the transverse direction. So there's the information, and that's a dual description. So on one side, when the gauge couplings, when the, when the rank of the gauge group is large, the gravity description is better. When the rank is small, the gauge theory description is better. So there are two dual descriptions. Again, we do not know, we cannot say what is an invariant notion of gauge forces versus gravity forces, therefore. Is the universe unique? The answer, of course, is a resolute no. And by this we mean the number of allowed solutions that could represent our universe is far from unique. This is somewhat discomforting. <laughs> so we thought that the Earth was the center of the universe, and they say, which universe? <laughs> is the question, no? So, so string landscape, uh, too many to count. There are so many to count, and people come up with the latest estimates are going up and up. I mean, basically, you can think of it as infinite. I think it's fair to say that's the better way of thinking about it. There's no way to bound this in this natural way. So we have a huge number of solutions, even if you restrict to more or less the kind of symmetries we want, even if you restrict to three plus one dimensions. Uh, now, it seems like there could be some interesting corners in this landscape. For example, the fact that we seem to have something resembling grand unified theories, perhaps with exceptional groups somehow lurking around, seems to be somehow interesting. So we might be in an interesting corner of, a, of some universe. That's possible. But we do not know. And at any rate, as a fundamental matter, whether, whether we should think about string theory fundamentally as being unique, leading to a unique universe, we know it's not true. So, so therefore, almost everything we can ask within the context of string theory seems to point in the direction that we are not, that we are giving up all of our principles that we kind of knew. So let me say uh, what Nambu and others set in motion more than four decades ago in the context of string theory is a source of remarkable advance in theoretical physics. So string theory is a, leading to a revolutionary revision of many of the fundamental and long-held principles of physics. It is somewhat embarrassing that we have said what cannot be held as an invariant notion, and we do not know what can be. In fact, I cannot, I cannot even point out to one thing that's a duality invariant concept in the context of string theory. Almost everything, well, everything that I know of can be replaced in different frames looks different. So I do not know of a duality invariant concept, so perhaps that's the principle itself, that there is nothing that you can pinpoint as being distinguishing, as being some object that everybody can agree on if you're starting with one, and each one will depend on where you start and which corner. So that's a strange thing. But it's clearly we, we need to say, but not everything goes, of course. In other words, when, for example, I was saying the topology is not an invariant concept, I didn't mean that a theory with any property of topology is equivalent to some, any other one. No. They're very specific rules. They're very specific conditions. So it's not like everything goes. There's some, some rules and, and rhyme to it. There's some logic to it. But how do you actually put that into some natural framework? What is it that you can say is an invariant notion? We don't know. There are many hints of new principle of relativity in the sense of duality frames, but we do not know how to put this in terms of an invariant notion. We do not know what it is. 
how to even go about phrasing the analog of what Einstein would formulate as an, as an invariant notion. But one thing is clear, that physics is already looking very different from when I was a graduate student. The things that we have learned tells us that many of the fundamentally held views that we had of physics is not true, but we do not know what is the, what is the framework which includes all of them in a consistent form. So I will stop here. Thank you. Already at that time, string theory looked very different from uh, conventional physics already in the, in the early days, and it only got more so. Anyway, Nambu used to refer to string theory as postmodern physics. I think that <laughs> seems very apt, given what we've just heard. Um, any questions or comments? I wonder if uh, one of the constants that is generally assumed is the string tension itself, or is that a variable? Frame well, you can, there's a, you have a scale in your problem, but as the example I showed when I was saying heavy and light string, that's what I meant by tension. So one of them had light tension and one was a strong tension. So that's not the duality invariant concept either. This is all. This is all fine, but ultimately, don't we have to test everything in terms of our technologies in four dimensions, four dimensional laws that we test? Yes. <clears throat> if we cannot test them by any technology that we know in four dimensional space and time, how are we going to know? Otherwise, I mean, mathematics allows us a lot of imagination. Okay, well, so your question, of course, is, uh, is a valid question, that uh, what is the connection of string theory with experiments, which we don't have today? And in the near future, I cannot offer a, a practical way to get the answer to that, given that we don't have the technology. Uh, so in the meantime, there are two or three different kind of answers to that question. First of all, quite independently of the main goal of string theory, which is a fundamental theory of physics, there are offshoots of string theory which are already impacting all these different areas of physics. That's number one, which, and these are areas of physics which you can see in plasma physics or condensed matter physics or this and that. So there are many different ideas coming from string theory. So if, if you, even if you don't view string theory as a theory of fundamental physics, you can view the string theory as the origin of many ideas which have had many applications. That's number one. Number two is that there are many uh, unexpected things that could come up with experiments which we don't know yet, things having to do with maybe black holes, Things may have to do with cosmology, that we do not know whether they fit or don't fit string theory, but that is the second question. The third one is, many of the questions in string theory are purely theoretical physics questions, like take a gauge theory. We take gauge theory and we start modeling it, like QCD. The models I was telling you about, SUN gauge theory, are very similar to what we do in QCD, maybe you have a few more matter and this and that. You might ask, can we say what these theories look like, at strong coupling? We now have answers to it using string theory. So there are many theoretical ideas and potentially connection with the experiment which are already around the corner. So I think the idea that the experiments today are not available should not hinder us not thinking about it. That's, that's my view of it. So I don't quite know how to formulate this in a meaningful way, but I can't resist asking at least a vague question. What, what is your opinion about sort of the quantum information theoretical concept like structure of entanglement as one of the candidates for what might be an invariant. Structure of, so in the context of what? In the context of? In the context of what is an invariant quantity? Oh, well those would certainly, those would certainly depend on the very first thing you'd have to start with the space to even define that notion. So even, I, I started with even more basic, even the notion of dimension of space is not an invariant concept. So when we talk about entanglement, you fix your description of a given space and a weak coupling description perhaps, or some particular region where you start your, your discussion. 
in that context, you can ask a question for that context, and that makes sense. So being near each particular corner, you can ask a question. My, my main question was, can we have a statement which is independent of which corner you're at? Can you say an invariant notion of what it is? Can you say anything about energy conservation? Well, uh, good question. Uh, the answer would be, we know that energy conservation is related to time translation invariance. So abstractly, you would say, well, what is time translation invariance? In these contexts, especially the kinds of quantum gravity, the notion we know of space and time is going to be quantum corrected quite, quite humongously. So the notion of space-time itself is, is quite a different concept. So I would say that the statement of energy conservation and all that will certainly refer to a particular frame. You have to have a description of a system to talk about it. Without giving any specifics. Sorry, go ahead. I, I, you, you said that we have all of these uh, evidences yes. of how string theory is. Yes. Yeah. But I'm saying you sound like a presidential candidate. <laughs> oh, no. Because you give the topics without, without any <laughs> <That's> specifics. <laughs> so you want examples? Each one of these has examples, of course. But I'm just stating the result. I gave you a few of them in concrete form. For example, the circle, R goes to 1 over R. I tried to go to that example because that was simple enough to show during the talk. Many of these examples are too complicated to show why and how, and I could, each one of them by itself could be a huge whole talk by itself, so I certainly cannot do that. But I, I wanted to, to take the opportunity to combine all of these, new, these things that we have as examples in string theory to put in a nutshell what we learned. But yeah, each one of them has a nice story behind it, so certainly it's not just a, a slogan. <laughs> So you have these um, relationships, and the question is, are there a hierarchy of relationships? In other words, there are some which are more universal than others, even though they will fail, because you give an example. But is there any way of cataloging them? Particular? You know, corner one and corner two have this in common, but that, that, is, that is not. In other words, they are kind of, I would say, effective invariants within a certain well, there are some aspects of, of what you're saying, which is there. If you decouple gravity, for example, the notion of dimension seems to be is, is invariant. So there's, there are some questions. So if you are not talking about gravity is mixed, then you can talk about dimension. So there are some pieces that you can be, make it invariant. But I would say that uh, if you include everything in, I do not know any. I do not know any particular one. So if you if you put extra conditions on what you what you don't want to change or what you want to keep fixed, then you can have then you can have some sub-things which are invariant. That's what, after all, in quantum field theory, the dimension of space-time is well-defined. So that, 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 how, how did that come about? Well, that's because you, you, you changed your question a little bit. You decoupled the gravity question part of it. I'd like to ask a question, but that is uh, selfishly in the sense of my book. <laughs> uh, you put forth a notion uh, in other contexts of something you refer to as a swamp class. You have a, like a status report Well, that's a, another example which I'm certainly very interested in. So the, for those who are not familiar, the question is whether or not, if you write down, so in, in, um, in field theory, we are used to writing down effective field theories. And if they pass certain checks like you know, anomalies and this and that, we believe in some form they could arise, perhaps as integrating out some other degrees of freedom. So we, don't, we have a kind of a feel about what kind of, what kind of quantum field theories, kind of things we write down could be effective descriptions, and we are fine with it. So people try to do the same mentality with gravity. They say, oh, yeah, just add the gravity to the equation, Einstein's equations, and couple them to matter. As long as it looks consistent, then you're fine. Well, we learned within string theory that that's not necessarily so. That is, there are some systems that you might naively think they're consistent, but they actually are subtly inconsistent. And so some of these subtly inconsistent reasons we have figured out, and some of them we haven't even figured out. So the notion of apparently consistent field theories that we think are consistent, we call them a swampland, which are not consistent, we call them swampland. That is, they fool us to thinking they are real. Now, uh, we do not know, so in other words, the question is, what is the universality property of a gravity coupled to matter, which tells us just by looking at the action or something, this is not allowed, or this is allowed. 
We don't know that yet. So we don't know what, what it is that distinguishes them. Uh, we, have begun to, we have begun to learn, actually, that there are some aspects of this that can actually be understood from gravity side. Uh, for example, there's this conjecture called the weak gravity conjecture, which is related to an example of Swampland, where the gravity in all these examples of string theory in all the corners are the weakest force. So the question was, can you actually come up with an explanation of that? Why is this the case? So this was observed by looking at string vacuum solutions. And some, some explanation has, uh, has recently emerged on gravity side. So that could potentially be expanded on. There are, there are examples similar to that. So you can try to come up with ideas from gravity to try to narrow the gap between what we know we cannot construct from string theory and what gravity tells you. So an, another example of it, which we have an explanation, is that in string theory, we have no global symmetries. But then people already had explanations of it based on gravity. So that's an example where if you try to write down a gauge theory coupled to gravity with had extra global symmetries, which is not gauge, you would say that's not possible. Well, that's an example of the would-be swampland, which has a kind of a kind of a gravity explanation. So in the context of black hole physics, for example. So there, is, there are examples like this, which I, I think that we should try to come up with the more uh, examples from string theory to guide us what kind of questions we should address from within gravity as saying this is inconsistent, but come up with purely gravitational reasons, gravity reasons, why they are ruled out. And so we should try to connect them. I think that's, I think one of the areas in string theory which is highly underdeveloped, and it's, I think it's about time to develop it. In the early days of string theory, it was said rather forcefully by some that low energy supersymmetry was a prediction of string theory. Where does that stand? Supersymmetry is a prediction of string theory, is the usual statement I heard. Who said low energy supersymmetry? That's fine. <laughs> so you would accept Planck scale supersymmetry? Yes, yes, yes. I think, I think most of the people say supersymmetry is a prediction of string theory. Now, low energy supersymmetry is a wishful thinking for, ours, for us, and we hope it's true. We don't know if it's true. So in other words, we, we hope that low energy supersymmetry will be a feature of, of, of the universe we live in. But certainly no model in string theory tells you it has to be so. But we don't know of an example of a string theory which makes sense at the, at the ultraviolet sense without supersymmetry. So we always seem to have supersymmetry in the game. It's not a proof yet, but I think that's what, by and large, we believe in. Thank you.